mitochondria. Is it possible to tell me what is mitochondria properly? Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us tonight. I see there are about 60 odd of us. Uh, Rodine, you have a question? It's okay, I'm fine now. Oh, yes, I, I wasn't speaking before. <laughs> That's okay, why you couldn't I'm... hear anything. Oh, okay, thank you. I see someone else with their hand up, but I don't know who it is. Does anyone else have a question? Richard? Not Richard. Okay. Um, Hi, Professor. Shanae or Shane? <laughs> Good evening, um, Professor. Yes, it's Shane. Um, I was wondering if it's able to enable the chat. Um, if everyone is asking, they would like to participate on the chat. Oh, it, it should automatically um appear. Can you see it now? did in, in initiate it um, and it seems to be working. Uh, there was someone else who wanted to ask a question. What else? We still cannot um, type in the chat box. Yes, I think it's only for uh, the guest members can't participate in the chat. I think you've changed that setting over there. Yes, so Akshar, how did you join this team did you use a my life email address or a student number or a separate email address a, a separate email address yeah so that's that's probably why because they're trying to limit it to um making sure that students use their student numbers um so which means that you won't be able to chat but as i say i don't have any problem with you interrupting to ask questions during the lecture, especially if I don't see your hand up. But the chat is functioning for those who are able to participate on that. All right, are we? OK, what this one? OK, I think we're about ready to start. And I am recording. OK, that's good. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to continue where we left off last week, uh, which was a, a discussion on chapter two of the textbook. And as you will recall, chapter two sets out the four primary definitions that you need to know. Um, I'm just having trouble here trying to find. OK, I think I'm getting there. Um, I'm just having a little bit of trouble. OK, so last week we had just begun the discussion on the, the rule of law and what it means and that it has various conceptions within the greater 
concept of the separation of powers doctrine. Because the separation of powers doctrine is possibly the most important concept you need to know for constitutional law. Because at all times you need to be aware that the legislature has defined powers. The executive has defined powers and the judiciary has defined powers. And when I say defined powers, I am meaning that they have powers explicitly provided in the Constitution and therefore they must comply with the rule of law in the conduct of their affairs. But our conception of the rule of law has a long history that can be attributed to our colonial uh, past and to the British common law system. So what we mean by that is when we are trying to establish if a member of the executive or if the legislature, for example, has failed to perform their duty adequately. It is not going to be easy to find a particular provision in the Constitution that says the president may do the following and he must do it in terms of the following procedure. So because there is very little detail provided in the Constitution. What we have to do in order to establish whether the conduct of the president or the conduct of the executive uh, of the legislature, for example, is justifiable and acceptable. We revert to the principle of the rule uh, of the principle of legality which is an inherent part of the rule of law. So what we mean by that is if you give the rule of law a strict interpretation, it means the president is allowed in terms of Section 91 of the Constitution to appoint his cabinet and in terms of Section 91 subsection 2, he may dismiss his cabinet. So that seems pretty straightforward. If the question was, what is the power of the president as far as the cabinet is concerned? But there's no further clarification provided about the circumstances under which the president may appoint or dismiss his cabinet. And therefore, when there is this vagueness about what exactly the power of the president, for example, is. We have to revert to using the principle of legality because the principle of legality is like a catch all concept where there is a specific set of criteria which enable us to reach a conclusion about whether the conduct is acceptable and is legally sound. So the, the screen refers particularly here to the conduct of the president. And as I've already mentioned, we know without any doubt that Section 91 of the Constitution says that the president can appoint and dismiss his cabinet. But at the same time, you have to read Section 91 in conjunction with various other provisions of the Constitution. And the starting point invariably is Section 1 of the Constitution. Because Section 1C says the president must act in terms of the rule of law. But Section 1D goes on and says further that all conduct must be accountable, open, responsive, transparent. And then you need to also understand 
that the president is obliged in terms of the oath of office which he took when he was inaugurated to uphold, defend and respect the Constitution. So that's the starting point in any discussion about what the president can or cannot do. But then we were faced with this very difficult scenario when on the 31st of March 2017, you will recall that at the stroke of midnight, President Zuma shuffled his cabinet. He issued a statement saying, I am shuffling the cabinet to ensure that we have more women in cabinet and that we have more younger people in cabinet. But the political parties of the opposition were not convinced. They had been alerted to the fact that the president was in fact shuffling his cabinet because he had received a security report indicating that Praveen Gordon and Mkebisi Jonas were trying to overthrow the legitimate state of South Africa with the government of the ANC as it was. And that is why the Democratic Alliance took the case to court. And they said, while we respect the fact that the president has the right to dismiss his cabinet, there's no doubt about that. What we are concerned about is what was the real reason and justification for the president to shuffle his cabinet in the way he did. And so now we're already facing the situation with how can anyone question the democratically elected president who represents the majority party in parliament because it represents the majority of the citizenry of South Africa who voted for the ANC. So, of course, it's, it leads us to question, do the DA even have the right to take such a case to court? And we know that our system of constitutional democracy obliges the judiciary to deliberate on these types of matters because we have an evolving and developing form of separation of powers. And so the principle of legality was the main thrust of the argument in the case of DA versus President Zuma. Because what the court held is what needs to be established for any executive conduct to be justified is can you prove that the conduct is actually rational? So rationality is in itself a confusing concept. But the court said rationality is the core of the principle of legality because where we can see that there is a rational connection between the means and the ends or put, put differently, where there's a rational connection between the information that the president relied on and the decision he made, then the court has no power to intervene because there is this rational connection. So the court said, how do we establish whether or not there's a rational connection? And the court said, we as the court are only permitted in terms of section 172 of the constitution 
to declare any exercise of public power, such as the president has done in this context, unconstitutional if there is no empowering provision that actually allows him to do what he has done. And so the court had to admit that there is an empowering provision, which is section 91, subsection 2. But that wasn't the end of the story. The court then had to go further and actually inquire into this rational connection. And the question then is, what is the legitimate purpose that has been given to the president in terms of section 91.2? It is that he may shuffle his cabinet if necessary. But is there a rational connection between what the president did at midnight on the 31st of March 2017? So the court then said, we are not just concerned with whether there is a connection between what the power of the president is and what he has done, but we are also concerned with the entire process. So is the entire process rational and therefore justifiable? Because the court held it is an inescapable and inevitable consequence of our understanding of rationality review to establish a relationship between the power conferred and what has ultimately transpired. And therefore, in the case of the president shuffling his cabinet, the court could not say that the president had acted unconstitutionally. But what they did do is they said the president has not satisfied this court that the information he relied on in shuffling his cabinet at the time and in the manner in which he did it is reasonable or rational or justifiable. And therefore, their conclusion was they said to the president, you must present to this court the reasons that made you shuffle your cabinet when you did and give us any documentary evidence upon which you relied. So that then is how you establish whether the conduct is rational or not. Is, is there a relationship between the power conferred on the member of the executive, no matter which minister it is, and what they have ultimately done? And the purpose of this rationality review is to assist us in holding our executive accountable. So the Constitution itself says that members of the, of the cabinet remain individually and collectively accountable. So Section 92 of the Constitution is unambiguous in that regard and states that regularly individual ministers must come to the to parliament and provide a report on what is happening within the ministry over which they have control exactly a week ago in fact it was the minister of higher education who had to account to parliament and along with him was the management of UNISA accounting for why it is that 20,000 additional students had initially been enrolled and why they then told why the minister then told UNISA not to enroll the students and why there was then this court decision saying that the UNISA must re-enroll the students. 
So that whole explanation had to be given to Parliament because Parliament represents us and they then can hold the minister accountable. And to make it more clear, possibly to use a situation from as recently as yesterday, we also know that the Parliament has the power to hold ministers personally or individually accountable by asking them to come to court and to provide a full disclosure about the conduct in their ministry. And I'm speaking here particularly about the former Minister of Social Welfare, uh, Minister Dlamini, who throughout her tenure as the Minister of Social Welfare was ultimately responsible for making sure that the South African Social Security Agency is able to pay the child support grants, the old age pensions, the disability grants to the people who desperately require that money to survive. And unfortunately for her, when she did appear in Parliament, she was not open and honest. And on account of that, she was then taken to court by the Black Sash and the Centre for Applied Legal Studies, where the, those two NGOs said to the court, if the Constitution says that ministers have to be held accountable, and we have seen now that Minister Batabile Dlamini has not been accountable because she hasn't actually explained why it is that she allowed the situation to occur in April 2018 already, where we were in serious doubt about whether the child support grants and old age grants could be paid. And to hold the minister accountable where the legislature had failed to actually say, you must do the following, the judiciary had to step into that breach and say to the minister, you have not been truthful to this court and you have put at risk the social welfare system that is existing in this society and therefore, we are going to hold you personally liable and you need to pay 650,000 Rand in costs to the Black Sash and to the Centre for Applied Legal Studies. So you can see, therefore, that even when Parliament fails to hold the executive accountable, the judiciary does have the power to hold them accountable in the event of a failure to perform adequately and where they do not account fully to the National Assembly. But most importantly, as I've indicated on the screen, even though our Constitution states that that minister may be recalled and dismissed as a minister on account of non-performance. This has not actually ever happened formally in our constitutional dispensation. We have seen a, a presidential cabinet reshuffle, but that is not the same as when the majority of the National Assembly vote and say a particular minister needs to be removed because they have not performed their duties as expected and they haven't accounted fully to this to us as this auspicious body representing all four well, as the 400 of us representing all of the South African population. So that is where we go back to that picture from last week about the difficulty of 
political friends and comrades holding each other accountable. And precisely because our legislature is dominated by a strong political party, which is characterized by strict party discipline, it's very seldom that you will see Parliament actually holding the executive accountable as it should. And that brings us then to the role of the judiciary in holding the legislature and especially the executive accountable. So you've seen this diagram before because I have it in the beginning of section of tutorial letter 102. But to me, it is such a powerful representation of what the Constitutional Court's main duty is, and that is to clean up the failures on the part of the executive. Like I've just explained, the failure of Batabile Tlamini to ensure a coherent process of the payment of social grants, the court had to say to her, you have to pay compensation to these law firms who've brought this matter to this court to ensure that the people are not prejudiced. So our entire understanding of the judiciary then is different from our understanding of the executive and the legislature, because as I've indicated, there is a very close relationship between the members of the legislature and the members of the executive. They are invariably, the majority of them from the same political party, because we have a dominant party democracy. So we know that the ANC has the majority in parliament and the ANC's president becomes the president of the country and he appoints his cabinet, the majority of whom are members of the African National Congress. The judiciary, on the other hand, is functionally and personally completely independent. So the idea is that the members of the judiciary need to be properly vetted. So we have had this discussion in our very first lecture about the role of the Judicial Service Commission in interviewing prospective judges and interrogating whether the judge or that person, if they're appointed as a judge, would be able to be completely independent, impartial, and not allow any personal prejudices or religious convictions or moral beliefs to impede their decision making. So our judges are supposed to have absolutely no obvious political allegiances. They might all vote ANC, but we don't know that for a fact. And in the way in which they conduct themselves in court, they should not be making it apparent where their political allegiances lie. So they have to, and I've used this expression before, and it's something that you have come across in administrative law. They need to prove that they are unbiased. In other words, do they have an open mind in every matter that comes before them and where they can carefully assess the law and this conduct that is being complained about and come to a conclusion that is defensible because they have interpreted the law correctly and therefore the decision that they reach is justified in law and can therefore be 
respected by the majority of the population. So that is the role of the judiciary. Their role is to hear and decide every matter that is brought to their court for adjudication. And it means that there will invariably be two sides who each have their own version of events. And they need to hear both sides. So the Audi alterum partum rule that you will have come across is relevant. Both sides must be given an opportunity to speak and provide the all the evidence that they have and the arguments must be put forward so that the court can decide the case without fear, favor or prejudice. And if they reach a conclusion that the conduct complained of, in other words, the way in which Butterbele Lamini conducted her affairs in as Minister of Social Welfare, or if they decide that a law that appears neutral is actually discriminatory, they must declare it invalid because it is a violation of the Constitution. So that is their functional role. So when you have to, in your mind, understand what is it that a court does, it adjudicates disputes between people and those people might be an ordinary citizen who has got a particular concern about legislation or an individual or a political party who has a concern about the way in which a minister has conducted their affairs. So they need to hear both sides, uh, balance all the evidence that is put before them and make a decision. And the way in which we ensure that they can do the job that is required of them is in terms of the concept of personal independence. What this entails is that a judge is appointed for a specific period of time. The judge is also paid a salary that is publicly announced. So we have legislation that is called the Judges Remuneration and Conditions of Service Act that we can all read that says a judge in the High Court will be paid 2.4 million rand per annum, for example. And therefore that information is in the public domain and the judge has been appointed for a particular period of time, he has been confirmed to be appointed as a judge by the president. He then swears an oath of office and says, I will at all times uphold the constitution and the rule of law and decide any matter that comes before me without fear, favor or prejudice. And therefore, we are or should be safe in the knowledge that the judge is certainly not going to accept a bribe to make a certain decision. And even more importantly, we know that if the decision that the judge makes is against the government or against the president, that that judge is not going to be fired purely because of the decision he made. And that's why I have to keep referring back to President Nelson Mandela's words in 1995 when the court held that he, as president, had made a mistake by amending the law. He said, this is what the court is supposed to do. So I respect the decision and I will therefore adhere to the decision and not in future amend any laws because I know that that is not my role as head of the executive. 
But, and now we come to the burning issue, that even though judges are expected to be independent and impartial and above reproach in every single case, the Constitution does allow for the removal of a judge. And that concept is the same concept that we'll come to learn about the president himself. And that is the concept of impeachment. So it's a concept you've heard of before because of um, Donald Trump and the fact that there were two attempts to impeach him. It's the same idea that if a judge has apparently been found guilty of gross incompetence by the Judicial Conduct Tribunal, or more importantly, if he has been found guilty of gross misconduct by the Judicial Conduct Tribunal, then he may be impeached. And I say may be impeached because that is only an initial step in the process. Just like it was the president who appointed the judge based on recommendations received from the Judicial Service Commission. Likewise, when the Judicial Service Commission Judicial Conduct Tribunal, which is a, obviously a part of the Judicial Service Commission, say, uh, makes a decision that the, the judge should be removed from office, in other words, impeached, the JSC has to tell the president that this is what they have found, but the process is that then the matter needs to be referred to Parliament so that the 400 people representing us actually make the final decision and vote on whether or not this judge should be impeached. And that's why I have at the bottom there in bold asking you to think about this ongoing case of the Chlope matter, where according to the Judicial Conduct Tribunal, he should be impeached. Because according to them, when in April 2008, he approached certain judges of the Constitutional Court using terminology like, you are our last hope, you must find in favor of our comrade. Those words apparently related to Jacob Zuma and the need for the Constitutional Court to find in Jacob Zuma's favor or else he wouldn't be able to become president. And therefore this was seen as being a unacceptable violation of the independence of the judiciary. So even a judge should not interfere in another court and in the decision making process. So because of those words uttered by Judge John Chlope, the Judicial Conduct Tribunal declared that he should be impeached. But he hasn't yet been impeached. He is still the judge president of the Western Cape High Court. And he is still a member of the Judicial Service Commission. When the Judicial Service Commission was recently conducting interviews for new judges in his jurisdiction, so in his court. So the process, therefore, and I have it there in square brackets, it's an ongoing process because all of the steps have to be properly fulfilled. And the ultimate step is for the National Assembly to make that ultimate decision of whether or not he should be impeached. So we are still waiting to see what the National Assembly will do. But in the interim, Judge Lope is still a judge.
that gives you an idea that for the most part, throughout South Africa's democratic history, there haven't been too many issues of judges allegedly being or acting improperly. There have been one or two where a judge, for example, ha held shares in a company called Oasis, and yet he had to decide a case concerning Oasis. But the, court, the, the courts were not convinced that it was actually improper, whereas the Judge Chlope matter is seen to be gross misconduct because he was trying to interfere in an ongoing court case in a court that he has nothing to do with because the Constitutional Court is based in Johannesburg, it is the apex court, and yet he is the judge president of the Western Cape High Court. So now this brings us to the critical question of, is it democratic for our judges to be given such far reaching powers to be able to declare that the law passed by the majority in Parliament who are representing the majority of citizens or any action by the president acting on behalf of the people because he, he is head of the, of the executive. Is it democratic for a judge to say you are acting unconstitutionally? And so I have on this diagram and what a what should look like a newspaper article. Are you all still with me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. Good. You were yes, very quiet. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this newspaper article is actually very typical of what we see in the news quite often where a, a spokesperson or the secretary general or the treasurer of a political party would say something like, when there are political disputes about the proper exercise of constitutionally conferred powers, there are people who rush to the courts and then the court decides in those people's favor. And the argument that is being made there is that it is alleged that some political parties, and of course the DA is, is probably one of the main culprits here because of the numerous times that they do rush to court to resolve political issues. Um, but, but we've seen more recently the EFF and the UDM have also had to resort to this conduct of going to court because the political issue can't be resolved any other way. And so the ruling party will say something like, all that's happening is that the opposition political party is trying to govern through the courts. So they are, are abusing the court system to f make decisions that are against what the majority of the people actually want. And that's why I say those kind of kinds of statements are the quintessential counter majoritarian dilemma. So as I've explained before. And hopefully you will recall this from our first lecture. We all participate in the elections. As. Adult citizens who have the right and the duty to participate in political activities in terms of Section 19 of the Constitution. So as soon as we reach the age of 18, we can vote. And our votes are then counted. And the party that wins the majority of votes 
then assumes the majority of seats in the legislature. Remember that it is a at this stage still a closed list proportional representation system. So that's why of the 400 seats, if the ANC wins 51%, it will be 267 seats. But if they win more, it's obviously 300 seats, for example. That is a clear majority. And in their capacity as the ruling political power, they should be able to pass any laws that they think are compatible with what the people want. Likewise, when the legislature elects the president, and we know then that the president is going to be a member of the African National Congress because they are the majority party, and the president then elects his cabinet, we also expect that they are going to do what is consistent with the ANC's policy decisions and with the legislation. So those ministers will then implement the legislation passed by parliament of which the ANC holds the majority and therefore their power should be evident in the laws that are passed and how those laws are implemented. And then along comes a, an individual like you or I, and we have the power to go to a court and say that we believe that the law that has been passed by the majority in parliament is unconstitutional, or we have the right to go to court and say that we think that the president has acted unconstitutionally. And then the judiciary is now seen to be this unelected small minority of people who are given immense power because they can declare that the law or the conduct is unconstitutional. And that's why we call it the counter majoritarian dilemma, because it looks as though the power of the majority is completely destroyed or usurped by a small minority of people who we did not put into their positions. So, a judge who's been appointed after undergoing an, an interview by the Judicial Service Commission is appointed by the president, but not because the president thinks that the person is the right person. It's because the Judicial Service Commission has said to the president, these are the list of people who you can appoint. And so therefore it looks as though it is completely undemocratic for people that we don't know, that we might not even like. And in, off, in most cases, if it's in a high court, it is one single judge who has the power to declare that the conduct of the president who was acting in the name of the majority of the people of South Africa is unconstitutional. But you need to understand, as I've said before, we have a decolonized form of separation of powers. And this is typical then of our decolonized form of separation of powers because what the judiciary is doing is merely reinforcing the rule of law and the supremacy of the Constitution in their decision making. So we are then supposed to, and in fact, Section 165 of the Constitution tells us that we have to respect the decisions of the judiciary and implement those decisions. So if the 
president has been told that he's done something wrong, he needs to rectify it as soon as possible so that the rule of law prevails and the supremacy of the Constitution prevails. So the the textbook goes into quite a lot of depth about why judicial review is justified. And those arguments are all very legitimate arguments. It is because the judiciary has been appointed through a rigorous interview process. And the persons who have been Re recommended to the president as possible judges all exhibited the ele well, essential elements that are required, which is that they are able to be impartial, independent, unbiased, and that they are not going to be prejudiced in any way or favor a political party, but that they have the integrity, the honesty, and the expertise to be appointed as a judge. And in that capacity, they therefore can con conclude based on an, a correct interpretation of the law, whether or not the judiciary, or rather the executive or the legislature has overstep their powers. And so the judiciary does have far reaching powers, but these powers are necessary in order to uphold the significance of our constitution and the way in which it was adopted, where the negotiators specifically said, we need a constitutional system where the judiciary is afforded sufficient power to declare any law or conduct unconstitutional. But more importantly, why it is not a violation of the separation of powers doctrine is because the judiciary knows the limits of its powers. So the judiciary is never going to rewrite an entire law. Instead, all it will do is say to Parliament, these are the problems with the law. These provisions are fatally flawed because they undermine the right against discrimination or the right to freedom of expression just as examples, and therefore you must go and amend the law. But you must amend the law the way you think is best, as long as the ultimate conclusion when the new law is, has been adopted is that it doesn't discriminate against anyone or does allow freedom of expression. Likewise, the judiciary will not arbitrarily tell the executive you have done something wrong you must now stop doing what you've been doing and we will come and do the work for you that is not what happens at all times the judiciary will merely go as far as saying to the executive if we use the the case of the midnight reshuffle all the court could do was say to President Zuma, show us the document that you relied on in making your decision and tell us the reasons. Obviously, as you know, before President Zuma ever had an opportunity to make that, bring that information to the court's attention, he had been recalled as president and pres President Cyril Ramaphosa then took over. So the case fell apart because there was no longer any need for the executive to justify his action there. Um, but in other cases, the, the judiciary will say 
to the executive. You have violated the separation of powers doctrine. So therefore, you need to disengage from this matter and allow parliament to do what it is supposed to do. So much later on, I discussed this, but it is a case that is in tutorial letter 102, and that is very important for your understanding of this type of situation. And that is the case of the Democratic Alliance versus the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. So it's often uh, I abbreviated to the DERCO case. What happened there is in 1980, let's say 1987, I think it was as early as sort of 1987 already, the United Nations kept saying, we need an international court that can hold leaders accountable if they are guilty of serious crimes, including crimes against humanity, genocide, the crime of aggression or other atrocities, including terrorism. And so there, it was a long, slow process of negotiating whether or not we needed a new international court. By 1998, the decision had been made that a court had to be established. And so the United Nations drafted the Rome Statute. So it, the, the statute is this international law. And because it was adopted in Rome and Italy, it became known as the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So that was 1998. By early 2000, so just two or three years later, South Africa realized we are now a equal member of the international community and we have a constitution that says we will uphold the rule of law and that we will not allow impunity. So if a person has committed grave injustices like crimes against humanity or genocide and they are in South Africa, they must be prosecuted. So South Africa then formally adopted a law. And as you know, it's the legislature's duty to draft a law. So Parliament adopted the implementation of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court Act of 2002. And this law clearly said, if anyone is accused of crimes against humanity and they arrive in South Africa, they must be arrested immediately and must then be transferred to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. So that was 2002. When President Jacob Zuma was inaugurated in 2009, one of the heads of state who was invited to attend the inauguration was Omar al-Bashir of Sudan. And at that time, as you probably are aware, the United Nations had concluded that there were crimes against humanity and possibly even genocide being perpetrated by the Sudanese government against the people of Darfur, which is a province of Sudan. So at first, Omar al-Bashir said, yes, I'll be at the inauguration. And then someone must have advised him that it wasn't a very good idea because he would be arrested. So he then very politely said, sorry, I'm not going to be able to attend the inauguration. And so a few years later, in 2015, the African Union held its 
summit of heads of state and government in South Africa. And at the time, it was Robert Mugabe who was the chairperson of the African Union. So in his capacity, he would have invited all the African heads of state to come to South Africa to have this meeting. It's an annual meeting. And at first, there wasn't any clarity about whether Omar al-Bashir would arrive or not. And then suddenly the newspapers provided photographic evidence and details about the fact that Omar al-Bashir had in fact arrived in South Africa and was now in Santon attending the African Union summit. So immediately a warrant of arrest was issued because that is what the law of South Africa dictated. So a warrant of arrest was in the process of being issued. And in order to get a warrant of arrest, advocates have to appear in the court and say to the judge, this person is in South Africa and he is accused of crimes against humanity and possibly even genocide. Therefore, in terms of the provisions of our implementation of the Rome Statute Act, he must be arrested. And the government, the advocates for on the uh, representing the government said, well, you know, he he isn't actually in South Africa and we we won't let him leave. We're not sure if he's going to leave, but we won't let him leave South Africa. And while the matter was being heard in court and before this warrant of arrest could actually be issued. What happened is that the presidential jet owned by Sudan, so Omar al-Bashir's country, was moved from OR Tambo International Airport to the Waterkloof Airport and a convoy of police escorts facilitated the transport of Omar al-Bashir from Santon to Waterkloof Air Force Base just outside of Pretoria. And what then happened is Omar al-Bashir climbed onto his aeroplane and flew back to Sudan. Now the whole essence of the rule of law is that if there is a law, it must be complied with. And the fact that a head of state had arrived in South Africa and had then also been allowed to leave South Africa again cannot happen without the president's knowledge. Section 85 of our constitution says it clearly that in his capacity as head of state, the president is responsible for receiving and recognizing heads of state of other foreign countries. So President Zuma had to know, there is no doubt about the fact that he knew precisely when Omar al-Bashir arrived and he knew exactly when Omar al-Bashir left the country. So because our entire government was now actually in violation of the rule of law, the government had to then account to the International Criminal Court. And this was very embarrassing because here we are as a new democracy who assert to the international community that we are con absolutely committed to the rule of law and the supremacy of the Constitution. And now we are being accused of having let a person who is guilty of serious or allegedly guilty of very serious crimes having left the country and therefore being or continuing to be immune from prosecution. 
And as a result of that, and this is where the DA case culminates. What happened is that the executive, so the president and the minister of international affairs, out of embarrassment, then declared to the United Nations that they were withdrawing from this Rome statute. So they were saying we no longer want to be a part of this international law, even though we have adopted our own domestic law, showing our commitment to upholding this law. But the problem with that is that in terms of section 231 of the Constitution, it says it is Parliament that must create laws and it is Parliament that must be able to with draft a new law that actually withdraws us from this international treaty. And so the court had to declare that the wrong procedure had been followed and that Parliament had not been given the duty to draft a law that withdraws us from the, the Rome Statute. It was the executive that had taken over the role of the legislature. So that's an important case because it shows you that our judiciary is constantly aware of exactly what the power of the legislature is and what the power of the executive is and tells them what the mistake is that they've made, but leaves it at that. It doesn't then say you can't withdraw. All it says is if you want to withdraw, you must follow the right processes. And that's why this counter majoritarian dilemma is contentious because it looks as though we have a judiciary that is given far too much power to actually tell the executive who is acting on behalf of the majority of the population that it is making mistakes, even when the executive is ostensibly doing so in the best interests of the country and of the country's reputation, for example. So that's why it's I have these two arrows facing each other, showing you that it looks counterintuitive. In other words, it looks absurd that we can have a judiciary that is given so much power that it can tell the executive and the legislature that they've made mistakes. So it may appear outwardly undemocratic, but in fact, it serves the real purpose of ensuring accountability transparency and compliance with the rule of law. So therefore, the Constitution has to be allowed to be interpreted by the judiciary in a way that makes sure that there is constant commitment to the entire Constitution by the legislature and by the judiciary at all times and that's why the judiciary can and must be able to declare any law or any conduct unconstitutional. So now we have completed our discussion of constitutional supremacy and the and separation of powers as the two important concepts that are crucial to constitutional law. The third is the rule of law, and this is a concept we've referred to repeatedly because the principle of legality is an inherent part of the rule of law. But you also need to understand the rule of law. In its own terms, so even though. The concept of the rule of law is uncertain and does not necessarily have a precise meaning or content. 
What we do know is that the state, meaning the executive, the legislature and the judiciary, in every single thing they do, must do so only in terms of what the Constitution allows them to do. They may do no more and they may do no less. Likewise, we as individuals have to comply with the rule of law. If the rule is that you drive 120 kilometers on the highway, then that is the rule. You can't decide I will drive 150 today just because I have a fast car. Even that is a violation of the rule of law. And in a society such as ours, we are all supposed to comply with the rule of law so that there is certainty and predictability about what everyone is supposed to be doing at all times, and therefore we can function harmoniously and cohesively in society because we all know what is expected of us. So this idea of the rule of law has a long history. And so we refer to it as the initial Dicean conception of the rule of law because a person called Albert Venn Dicey in Britain formulated this idea of what the rule of law means. And he says, if we really believe that the law is supreme, then the rule of law means that any public power conferred on the legislature, the executive or the judiciary can only be exercised in terms of the powers that have been conferred on them by the Constitution or any other empowering act. They cannot just do as they please or exercise power arbitrarily. So that's the first thing. If there's a law in place explaining how conduct should be executed by the legislature, judiciary or executive, then that's what they must do. It goes further than that, though, and involves individuals by saying everyone is equal in the eyes of the law. So the law has to be applied the same to every single individual. Regardless of their status. So even if it's the president, he is not allowed to do anything other than what the law says he can do. And most importantly, if there is an allegation that someone has contravened the law, then they must be subject to the ordinary courts of the land. Meaning if you are then pulled over by a traffic officer for traveling at 150 kilometers per hour, you need to be sent to the magistrate's court to account for what happened and try to defend yourself. What, what I'm implying here is that special courts cannot be created for certain individuals and other individuals subject to different courts. There must be ordinary courts that apply to everyone and the same law applies to everyone in those same courts. And therefore, the third aspect is it is these ordinary courts that are empowered to interpret and apply the law so that everyone is either found guilty or not guilty based on the facts in conjunction with a proper reading of the law. Because if the courts can do this, it upholds the rule of law. Now, where this third conception comes from is in England, there is no 
single written constitution. And that's why there's this idea that the courts in England, in making their decisions, are actually drafting a constitution. Because just like we have the notion of precedent, England, and that's where we inherited it from, has this notion of precedent. So those court precedents then become the common standard. But it's also important in our context where we have this young democracy and a, a new constitution that our courts can interpret the constitution so that we all know what the constitution actually means. And therefore, if we all know what the constitution means, our rights will be protected because we know, therefore, that you can't be arbitrarily arrested on the street simply because you're a black male person and there's this sort of obvious um, idea that you must have perpetrated an offense, as we know is the sort of the, the narrative in the United States at the moment. So that's the idea is that we have the law, it must be applied properly, equally, uniformly, and that precedent is therefore setting so that going forward, we know what the rule of law means. But that notion was very typically British. So a South African called Anthony Matthews then wrote an article in 1964, and he said, if we look at our system of apartheid now, and we try to move towards a system where we have a democracy, we need to have a rule of law that is no longer going to be oppressive. So what we need is to formulate the rule of law that will work in the South African context. And it's very telling then that what he has said in 1964 is actually the way it's being interpreted and applied now. Where the first point he made is that if we call ourselves a decent society, then the state cannot and should not wield arbitrary power over, uh, over individuals, because we know that that was a characteristic of apartheid, where arbitrary laws such as a black person and a white person must stand in different queues in the post office, or a white person and a black person may not sit on the same chair in a park. Those kind of arbitrary uh -huh. laws. Yes. Is someone does someone have a question? I think it was a mistake, ma'am. OK, OK, well, let us try and move. I see we all I always talk too much, but let me get to the third. The second point, he said. If we want a society that can be respected and where the rule of law is genuine, then all persons should be equal in the eyes of the law. And he he included included including government officials, which is very much reminiscent of what Dicey had said about irrespective of status. But that point that he was making there is that we can no longer have a system of segregation where white people and black people are treated differently purely because of the color of their skin. We need a system where everyone is treated absolutely identically. And then he went on, and this is where our the, this immense power of our judiciary is is a is a, a sort of a reflection of where he says effective judicial remedies will afford the individual greater protection than simply constitutional declarations. And that is exactly true of our 
constitutional democracy where we have this decolonized separation of powers and where the judiciary can actually declare that any law or any conduct is unconstitutional because it's very well and good to have this constitution that says the president must do certain things. But if if there's no control mechanism like the judiciary, then what's going to stop the president from doing as he pleases? And that's why we have a judiciary that is given the power to make binding decisions that are equally valid and applicable to everyone in society. And so I, I go on, and this is not necessarily in the textbook, but it's it's the general thinking about how we should understand the rule of law in South Africa. That it's not just a, a formal concept like remember our discussion last week on the difference between formal and substantive equality. We don't just have a formal conception of the rule of law. It is substantive, meaning it has real meaning and content. Because if we truly are a state that is premised on the rule of law, then the government will only ever act in terms of pre-announced, clear, accessible, and general rules. In other words, they'll act only in terms of the Constitution and any other laws that have been officially passed. They will not um, make decisions based on their own whims or desires at a particular time because then the, the situation is one of vagueness and uncertainty which is the antithesis of the rule of law so secondly in a state premised on the rule of law rules are created by the legislature and they must then be enforced by the executive, and if there are any disputes pertaining to these rules, they must be adjudicated by an independent, impartial court. So that's a really good summary of the, how our separation of powers works. Thirdly, no rights of people may be arbitrarily limited or deprived. So you can't have a situation which I'm sure I said this before, where Zimbabwe was an example under President Mugabe, who would pretty much wake up in the morning and decide as of today, I want no foreign non-governmental organizations working in this country anymore. So he would arbitrarily make rules that were not in terms of any law and that deprived certain people of their rights because if you were an employee of that ngo for example you suddenly were left unemployed because of an arbitrary discretionary power and number four very crucial to the rule of law is that no one is above the law everyone must comply with the law all of the time and if if we are uncertain about whether or not someone has complied with the rule of law because the constitution or the law might not explicitly say you as an individual may not walk on the grass of a park in Johannesburg for example if there is this sudden interpretation of the law and you want to go to court and say but i was walking on the grass because i believe that it's a public space and as a person who's equal in the eyes of the law i'm allowed to walk on that grass remember that because the constitution might not say anyone is allowed to walk on the grass in johannesburg 
what the court would have to do is rely on the principle of legality and say, is there a legitimate connection between what the person has done and any law that says the, that the, the police can arrest the person. If there's no rational connection between the two and you've been arbitrarily arrested, it is a violation of the rule of law. So remember that the principle of legality is an inherent part of the rule of law and is used when there are not explicit terms indicating exactly what the law says. But you know that this just doesn't fit. There's something not right here. And then you can revert to the principle of legality because it is concerned with whether there's a justifiable reason for how you were treated. So we've got a number of court cases all interpreting the rule of law. The essence, though, is uh, uh, in the 1999 case of Fed share is probably the one that everyone's most familiar with, especially if you are already doing administrative law. But the rule of law in its fundamental sense means that in our constitutional order, the legislature and the executive operating at the national sphere at the provincial sphere and the local sphere are all required to conduct their affairs strictly in terms of the law and may not exercise any power or any function beyond what has been conferred upon them. In the more recent case of the economic freedom fighters versus the Speaker of the National Assembly, and this is the, the first in Kandla case, the words of, of Judge Cameron are very compelling, where he said, a failure to comply with the rule of law invites a vortex of uncertainty, unpredictability, and irrationality. And that is what you're seeing in countries like Som Somalia from our discussion last week. Because there is no legitimate functioning government, there is no rule of law, and there's no certainty, no predictability, no rationality, and therefore the, the, fun the society cannot function effectively. In, in addition, in the EFF case, the court said those clothed with the legal authority to make rules must make rules that we must all comply with. And if there's non-compliance, even by the president or the speaker of the National Assembly, anyone can approach a court to ensure that the rule of law is actually complied with. So the Chief Lasapo case is a simple case of a situation where the, the Agricultural Bank of the Northwest came along and expropriated land because money was owed to them. And the court had to say, you have no right to arbitrarily expropriate that land from the person or take, you know, deprive them of their land simply because they owe you money. You have to follow proper procedures. Otherwise, you are taking the law into your own hands. Is there a question? No, there is some um, background noise that is not making us to hear you clearly. Okay. Um, who? Okay, I can't see now what's happening there. Um, all right, I, I'm sure I don't have to um, re repeat that, but the point I was making is that everyone who complies with the rule of law follows the procedures set out in the law. 
and they do not take the law into their own hands. So that's why we have this concern with, for example, vigilantism and where the community might accuse a person of theft and then they will beat him and often kill him um, because they allege that he is the perpetrator. All of that conduct is seen to be contrary to the rule of law because you are not supposed to take the law into your own hands, but you are supposed to make sure that the police are called and the police then enforce the law and investigate whether the person is in fact the thief or not. So that's a, a very broad understanding of the rule of law, but it just reinforces the knowledge that if the law says you can do something, you do it. If it says you cannot do something, you don't do it so that we have certainty and predictability. And now the last concept. That is essential to your understanding of constitutional law is democracy. I have already discussed this in lecture one. So I'm going to try and move quite a lot faster than I have been, but you need to know. That South Africa is special for the fact that we have five different forms of democracy all operating at the same time. We know that we're a constitutional democracy because we have. A properly functioning separation of powers. Our constitution is supreme. There is adherence to the rule of law. We are a democratic state that holds elections regularly that are free, fair and without any corrupt activities. So related to that then. Is the fact that we are not just a. Multi party democracy, which is number four. But we have taken the concept of multi party democracy to an, a further extent by saying that our form of multi party democracy results in representative democracy. As you know, we are a population of over 55 million people in South Africa alone. So I know some of you are not in South Africa, but think about your own countries. When there are 55 million people, it's impossible for everyone to have a say on every single matter. And that's why we have these elections to choose those people who will represent our interests in Parliament. And that therefore we empower those representatives in Parliament to choose the president on our behalf. Because we have given them that power to represent us and make sure that our best interests are taken care of, but that we can't be doing it ourselves. So we have to hand over this power to those representatives in Parliament. But we're also a participatory democracy because we are supposed to participate whenever legislation is being drafted. We are not supposed to sit back and let legislation be passed without actually being concerned about what the legislation is. And that's why there's an obligation on Parliament to inform the people about what the draft legislation is that they are dealing with. And that's why, for example, the current bill on expropriation of land without compensation is widely documented and the and Parliament keeps saying we are wanting submissions from the people and we are actually going to do. I'm going to use the expression road shows, but I don't think that's the best way to put it. But we ourselves are going to send delegations to all of the provinces to receive input because we want the people to participate in this process of draw of amending the constitution 
because it is going to have far reaching effects. And we know that we're a multi party democracy because there is nothing prohibiting all the political parties that wish to be established to then formally register with the Independent Electoral Commission and participate in the elections. We are also, despite the fact that I've said that we are a population of over 55 million, we know that we're a direct democracy because we are allowed to protest and to petition and to take to the streets to voice our grievances. That is the essence of direct democracy. And we know that I think the statistics are something to the effect of that there are 30 different service delivery protests happening across South Africa every single day. So democracy, in case you are not aware yet, unambiguously means that we have universal adult suffrage that is no longer dictated by the color of your skin. We have a national common voters role where every adult person over the age of 18 has a right to participate again irrespective of the color of your skin. That we have regular elections. Every five years we have elections without fail. And we are a multi-party system. When all of these characteristics are combined, we can be assured that we are living in a democratic state. And you can then contrast that against the apartheid system, which was most clearly undemocratic. So where democracy finds its sort of crystallization or clearest indication in the constitution is in section 1D that says, we are a multi-party democracy and that our democracy is premised on ensuring accountability, openness, transparency, and responsiveness. And I emphasize responsiveness precisely because of the service delivery protests. Those protests cannot be in vain. They are supposed to inf be informing the government that they are failing in their obligations and the government must then react. So these concepts or these indicative elements, I call them, of our constitutional democracy inform us that our government is only established because we have actually given them the consent to govern us because we elected them. We also actively participate in all political and civic life by being able to protest when it's necessary or make recommendations to parliament when laws are being passed. We also know that we're a democracy because our human rights are protected in terms of the constitution. We have a system of democracy that is majoritarian in nature. We cannot dispute that. But at the same time, minority parties are also afforded the opportunity to be represented in parliament and to speak for those people who are affiliated with those minority political parties. And a democracy also means that there are constitutional restraints on what the government can or cannot do. So it's section 19 of the constitution that tells us that we must participate as equal citizens in our democratic processes. And that's why I start here with direct democracy, because it means that as an equal citizen, 
we all have the right at all material times to participate in the governance of our society, even though we are so big and complex and we're a modern nation state where we have a legislature to do certain work and we have an executive to do certain work and we are sitting in our respective places of employment doing something that obviously only applies to us. But we can vote on every piece of, of legislation through a, re a participatory process. If we make recommendations to Parliament that are rational and reasonable and Parliament adopts those, re those recommendations, we will have contributed to the legislative process even though we in the mo in the ordinary course of events we are too busy with our own lives and we give over the role of passing legislation to parliament but we can participate directly as individuals to the extent possible and so here as i've pointed out picketing demonstrating assembling assembling and making it known to government that it is not complying with its constitutional obligations is a classic instance of direct democracy. In smaller countries, referendums might be held. And in South Africa, a referendum was held in the early 1990s where the question was put, of course, only to the white South Africans, but the question was, do you want South Africa to become a non-racial democracy? Yes or no? And the majority voted yes. So that's how it, what a referendum is, is where each person actually has an individual say but because we are such a huge population it's not as easy as it sounds and in England the referendum to for for Britain to leave the European Union was a very special referendum because every single citizen or adult citizen was given the right to vote and of course it entailed a lot of money and processes to be followed, but it was the only way to get proper consensus on what the way forward should be. And that's why in South Africa, a referendum was held to decide whether or not we become a democracy. I have mentioned the Merafon case before because I call it di direct democracy in action, showing that even though the Constitution says that we have a right to participate and have a right to make our grievances known. In the Merifong community, where 74% of the community said, we refuse to be moved from the Gauteng province to the North Northwest province, the unfortunate consequence was that the constitution was amended and the relocation took place. And because the people realized that their wishes and their needs had been completely ignored, what happened was widespread violence, destruction of property, and Kutsong, which was the most affected part of Merafong, became ungovernable and resembled a war zone showing you that the government is supposed to be responsive and open and transparent when making decisions. And if you indicate by a clear majority that you don't want something to happen, the government is supposed to respect that. But un unfortunately, the court held that even though there was this widespread discontent 
the government had at least afforded an opportunity for everyone to be heard. So it was seen as being sufficient public participation to render the constitutional amendment valid. So we can criticize the judgment. Many people have criticized the judgment, but it's an indication that we should actually be heard and the government should respond unlike they did in the Kutsong scenario. So I've already mentioned this, that the only workable form of democracy that actually suits South Africa because it is so large and so pluralistic, meaning there are so many different groups, all with different needs and interests, we have established a representative form of democracy where we vote in the elections so that the 400 people sitting in parliament can represent us to the best of their ability and we can get on with our lives in the hope and trust and faith that they will do so in our interests. And for the most part, as we know, they do that. So I've mentioned here that we have this closed list re proportional representation system. That is until the present moment still the way that we are a functioning representative democracy. But there is an amendment to the legislation that is currently underway because the new nation movement, am I? Yes, I think it's the new nation movement case, which comes up in the next chapter, is the case where, and we've discussed this before, where a group of people who decided that they didn't want to become a political party, but also wanted to be able to participate in governance processes, were being denied the right to part to be eligible for vote to be voted for in the elections. And that's why what is currently underway is an amendment to our electoral system so that independent associations and not only political parties can be voted for and can assume positions in the legislature so that they can represent their constituency or grouping, whoever is aligned with them, even though they are not a political party per se. And that is important because for too long, political parties have had all the power and individual groupings have had to spend huge amounts of money formally establishing political parties. And because some of them couldn't afford it, um, I think Black First, Land First were one of those who couldn't actually afford to pay the exorbitant fees to, to participate in the elections, were told, sorry, you are not, not eligible to participate. And that's what happened with individual associations as well. And that's what's necessitating the change to our, our electoral laws. But there's still a year to go because the judiciary, as I said, knows the limits of its powers. So it didn't say, yes, we must change the electoral system and this is how it should be. They said we are declaring the Electoral Act invalid, but we will give Parliament 24 months, so a considerable amount of time to carefully consider what the new law should say. And we're now halfway into that 24 months. So within a, in the next year, a new law will be passed. Then the Richter case is one of those that deals with the fact that people living outside of South Africa who wanted to be able to vote in elections, were told, sorry for you, you're not in the country, we haven't got the capacity to allow you to actually participate and choose representatives. And the Richter case changed all of that because 
then it was held that the embassies, the South African embassies or consular offices in every capital city across the world, to the extent that it is practical, must make voter registration possible and must allow voting to take place, even though the people are no longer living in South Africa or might not be in South Africa at that particular time. So that has also been a radical change to our system where in the past, if you were out of the country for work or on holiday, you missed out on the election. And so in, a, in addition to this idea of a open, transparent, responsive government, the My Vote, Count, My Vote Counts nonprofit organization went to court and said, we are very concerned by the fact that some of our major political parties are seemingly deriving huge amounts of money from organizations and people that might be willing, wanting to influence the lawmaking process or the governance of our country. And we therefore desire for there to be far more transparency. And in terms of this, we want political parties to publicize exactly where they get their money from. And that's why we now have what is called the Political Party Funding Act. Representative democracy is also evident in the DeLille case, which I've spoken about before, and I'm going to be very brief again, where while Patricia DeLille was still a member of the Pan-Africanist Congress, she had been elected as a member of the Pan-Africanist Congress, as a member of parliament, and while the parliament was sitting one day, she stood up and she said, I'm going to make a formal statement in parliament that some of the people sitting here before us are actually apartheid era spies. And the speaker of the National Assembly said, you must apologize and you must withdraw that statement. It's unparliamentary to make statements like that. And she did withdraw. She said, I unconditionally withdraw the statement. And yet she was suspended from Parliament. And I, I, I can't resist mentioning the fact that while we've just mentioned Hlope in the context of impeachment, at the same time, Hlope is so highly regarded because of the decision he made in the DeLille case where he said, if Patricia de Lille was appointed by her political party to represent the political party and the party received sufficient votes and she assumed her position there, she could not or cannot be suspended from the from parliament because that denies all of the people who she is representing an opportunity to be properly represented. And so Judge Lopez said her suspension was unconstitutional and she therefore had to go back to Parliament immediately. So Lope is regarded as making significant contributions to our represent our, our entire constitutional democracy, but representative democracy in this important case. Um, this is really just kind of a rhetorical question where I want you to just apply your mind to whether representative democracy truly works in the South African system and does it give effect to an open, accountable, transparent system that we expect now that we are a non-racial democracy. So multi-party democracy also doesn't require much discussion except to say or to repeat the very um, pronounced and 
important wording of the court in the U an early UDM case where the court said multi-party democracy contemplates the kind of political order where it is permissible for a variety of different political parties to all come together, promote their views through public de debate and to participate in free elections and if they are so elected to assume their positions in parliament. And that is significant because there are many countries that do not respect or have anything like multi-party democracy. And in those countries, there is one party, whether you like it or not, you don't even have an election. You just have to accept that that is the governing party. So we have a true multi-party system and we are a participatory democracy because we can participate. And the classic cases that we have to refer to are the Doctors for Life case from 2006, which was the one of the earliest cases where the court said, if we are a true democracy, parliament must make sure that everyone can participate when drafting legislation. So what had happened is that Parliament had secretly drafted four pieces of legislation dealing with such controversial and sensitive issues such as the termination of pregnancy. And Doctors for Life, which has a, a sort of Christian focus, realized that these laws were now going to impinge on their religious convictions as doctors, so all the members of this organization, because they would now be required to perform abortions when it was against their religious beliefs or their moral and ethical viewpoints. And so the court said, we have to respect the fact that in a participatory democracy such as ours, pluralistic accommodation has been calculated to produce laws that are legitimate and that can be widely accepted. And therefore you cannot exclude anyone from the legislative process, especially where you know that it is a highly contentious issue, like the current example of expropriation of land without compensation. Um, so th this is just a further explanation of the facts of the Doctors for Life case, where the, the bills that would affect healthcare professionals had been passed in secret, and when they became aware of it, they went to court and the court said, even though these bills have not yet become law and the general rule from the Glen the Glenister case came later, but it's the same logic is we as the judiciary should not intervene in the legislative process until it is complete. But in this case, we can see that it is necessary for us to intervene now because it's too late once the acts have been passed and doctors are then required from that very day onwards to be performing abortions, which they will are, are religiously opposed to. So that's where the notion of real participatory democracy was given its best expression is in the Doctors for Life case. But of course, there have been many subsequent. So constitutional democracy, you know that by now that it means a system where our society respects everyone in society, not just the majority, but the minority as well. And that everyone must be given an opportunity to participate and that every action 
must be consistent with the Constitution so that we have a system where our Constitution is indeed supreme and is justiciable, as I've mentioned last week. You can go to court alleging that the Constitution has been violated. A constitutional democracy is also one where there is a true culture of human rights protection and where there's a commitment to all kinds of democratic ideals. So we don't exclude socialists from liberals. We in allow different parties with different political ideologies all to have equal opportunities to have their say. And most importantly, as a contrast from the apartheid system, we are now most certainly a non-racial, multicultural, multilingual society. So I know that that is a lot that we've been through and it has taken us two full hours instead of one, but it is these four concepts that we've now gone through that permeate every single other part of the textbook that needs to be studied for constitutional law. And so, of course, you I have to say this again just to appease many of you, but it is only up to chapter eight of the textbook that you need to study. So it is most of chapter eight, but the last bits we've left out, it's far too technical and it's not necessary for you to know it at this stage. So next week's lecture then will be delivered by Professor Shai, where he will discuss chapter three of the textbook, which is separation of powers, because the Constitution doesn't say it, but we know we have a separation of powers. And so he is going to elaborate on the kind of decolonized separation of powers that we have. So I'm hoping that this is all still recording. Yes, it looks like it. It's perfect. OK. Uh, are there? OK, <laughs> yes. OK, so are we all happy? Are there there's questions? I can't see whose name it is. Lungatani. Lang Langutani. Do you have a question? No, that's not you. Anyone with questions? Yes, ma'am, I have a question. Please ask it. Uh, ma'am, I wanted to know whether are you expecting any assignments submitted now from second semester students? Yes. Unfortunately, oh. this year is unlike any other year at UNISA. So we have this notion of super semester where even though you are registered for the second semester, there isn't a second semester. There is only one semester. So at this stage, you need to submit your first assignment on the 24th of May. Whether you are a first semester, second semester, or an early completion, what does ECP stand for? Early completion program student. I was in a meeting earlier today where they were saying that they, there's a slight chance of another extension on that because some students are still only registering now, but the short answer is yes. Assignment one has to be in on the 24th of May for every single student registered for constitutional law and any other module that you're a second semester student. There is no second semester. Okay, I'm sorry, so I'm sorry, but that's just the truth. All right, are we any other questions? I can't see any names. Hello. Uh, so please, yes, feel free to ask. Uh, Prof. Audwa. I don't know if that was Audwa. Oh, no, not at all. That's okay. Yes, I'll let Audwa speak. Yeah. Oh, thank you so okay. much. Um, 
I, I just wanted to ask Prof um, regarding the the assignments. Um, yes, we are expected to 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 submit on the twenty fourth. But my confusion is whether we have to, if you were registered for the second semester. Yes, there's no second semester. Are we still doing assignment one that is end of the first semester? Because yeah, that's that's you the, the confusing part. The assignments in tutorial letter 001. Okay. So it's not the assignments in 101, but 001, which is 001. Yes. It's, thank you, thank you, it's a short yes. document. It's the only assignment questions. Yes. Thank you. The, I, I don't know who the gentleman was who was speaking just before. Odwa, you can carry on, please. Uh, uh, it's Cabello. Um, yes. My question is this, Prof. Um, I read the email that you sent earlier regarding how we can access content. Yes. Um, I've tried to do that all the time, but it's not happening. I don't know if it's because I appear as a guest or whatnot but um, i'm under the impression that i'm currently on meetings using my unisa email and yet i still appear as guest so i don't know if there's any other way perhaps we can access previously posted content because at this very point the only thing i can do is just get on the lecture and there's nothing else so do you not have the this, this the screen that shows general posts and files no, and not when you all. click on files, it goes to recordings. Not, not at all. I'm extremely restricted in a lot of stuff. I can only raise my hand and see participating people. Or well, then what I would suggest you do is write me an email and I will then try and add you to the group because you might not have been formally added to the group. Okay. No. And I'll that's what's been that. happening with a lot of people. So so it's Excuse you me, might I have the same thing. Yes. So please, if you have that problem, email me. I'll try and add you. And I believe that that might make a difference. All right. So I appreciate it, Prof. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Um, yes, I have a question, Prof. Yes. I want to ask, um, when we read about the history of South Africa, um, the questions also appear. So my question is that why is it that their language is not added in the in the official languages of South Africa? Why is it difficult for the um, for the president or whoever to put their language in the official languages of South Africa? Well, interestingly, um, that I don't have an answer for why they haven't done that. But what ha they have done, and I don't know if you have the first edition or the second edition of the Constitutional Law and Context textbook, but what is new in the second edition is that there's a whole chapter now on traditional leadership, and it includes the Khoisan Leadership Bill, which has now made it absolutely clear that the Khoisan are of equal status to every other tribal grouping or and and therefore their their leadership systems and their governance systems have to be respected like we do with the zulus causas etc so there is a move towards full and unambiguous recognition but I don't know why it's not made an official language. It probably could be. Uh, and I think that the Khoisan have been protesting long enough outside parliament that at some stage there should be an acknowledgement or a response, let me put it that way, that they are equally deserving of the respect that, yeah, they, are, that they are simply asking for. That so is I don't true. have a good answer for you, I'm afraid. OK, Prof, thank you. Um, so, Cabello, your hand is still up. Is that old hand? Was it? Hello, Prof. Uh, it's an old hand, sorry. OK, so it's Tembasile. Yes, Sile. Tembasile is the one speaking now. Good, yes. OK, I want to ask, I see a lot of the students are studying law, but I'm not, I'm a political student. So we have terms like, I think it's it speaks to, um, 
legal sovereignty and uh, political so uh, sovereignty. So in South Africa, would you say, because now that we're talking about the constitutional law, constitutional law and the rule of law, that they're actually together or is one dominating over the other? Look, I think to, to my mind, we the, the better interpretation is legal sovereignty. Because if we say political sovereignty, then it does seem to imply that the ANC, which is dominant, has more power and can make decisions that impact on others that they might not feel comfortable with. So I would say the better, better concept is legal sovereignty. Um, or, or let me put it this way, we have legal sovereignty in the domestic context, but we do have political sovereignty in the international context because we have to be recognized politically as that geographical area on the south of the African continent with a proper political organization with a government that is in control and that is why we are accepted in the international community mm -hmm. as a equal member because we have this political sovereignty um we no longer un under the control of the imperialists who were imposing their political and legal beliefs on us so uh, to me i'm i'm afraid it, you're going to have to try to just understand it as legal sovereignty in the constitutional con context and perhaps in the for example the the case i discussed earlier about omar al bashir coming to south africa that might be a case of political sovereignty because south africa was in that case only hosting the African Union summit, but the the jurisdiction was then supposed to be African Union and not South African. So it's it's I know it's very complicated and I I don't have a absolute answer for you. Okay. But I do think rely on legal sovereignty rather than political sovereignty in the constitutional law context. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I hope that helps. Um, Senzo, are you having a question? Yes, Prof. Good evening, Prof. Good evening. Uh, Prof, I have two or three questions. Yes. My question comes from what you mentioned uh, when you spoke about, I think you said Party Funding Act. Yes. Um which was um, from the NPO, NPC or something. Yes, non-profit company. So it, it really all it means is a group of people who've come together uh, um, like an association, but they're formally registered and they say, we want or, or our entire mandate is to yes, fight prof. for um oh. i did get that part yeah okay now, yes. my question is the case was i think it was 2018 but now we have not seen the results of what they were complaining for because i've never had any political party that has declared where they get the funding unless i am misinformed so I wanted to check why does it take so long to unfold all these issues that they raised. And then my second question, Prof, is um, the three arms of states, which is the executive, parliament and the judiciary, they are independent of each other. But yes. the other two seemingly accounts to the judiciary and yes. why okay. does it seem that the judiciary is more independent than the other two on top of that prof 
the judiciary must account to the JSC, right? Yes. So I also wanted to check what constitutes the JSC. Okay, those are excellent questions. Thank you, Prof. Um, uh, I, I must admit, you know, the, the Party Political Funding Act largely came out of these allegations in Parliament by the DA that Bosasa had been paying 5 million or 50 billion towards the ANC. And I think that's where it arose from. Um, but I, I also don't know when exactly they are supposed to be providing this accountability. You, it might be, I mean, we're about to have or soon to have local government elections. Mm. And so it could be a case of when those political parties are now formally registering for the election that will take place in October, that at that stage they need to provide the evidence of what their political funding, what it's, where it's derived from. Because I, I also don't know, I haven't heard of any, you know, any major exclamations about where the money comes from um, besides what we hear with uh, through the, the State Capture Commission of Inquiry that the State Security Agency allegedly gave so much money to the ANC, but there hasn't been any final conclusion by Judge Zondo about what all of that means and whether there really is truth to those allegations. So I, I'm not sure exactly when the process is supposed to happen. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't actually come across anything on that point to be able to answer very well. Um, so moving then on to your second question, the JSC, why we can quite confidently say that it is able to hold the judiciary accountable is because section 178 tells us that as far as possible, the JSC is not supposed to be politicized. So okay. it mustn't be dominated by too many people from one political party. And that's why it expressly requires that a member of the opposition parties are present. So that's why Julius Malema is a member of the Judicial Service Commission. Mm. Um, the, in, in addition, so there are, of course, some ANC members, but there are enough non-political figures like acting advocates and attorneys and the premier of a province when issues regarding a province are to be decided who are supposed to be sitting there in their capacity as a person who is committed to the rule of law and and that i'm talking about in, in, in the case of sort of a practicing attorneys and advocates who when they are ad formally admitted, there is a solemn declaration that I will uphold the laws of the country. And likewise, when a premier of a province is, is inaugurated as the premier, and when a member of a political party like the EFF takes office, they do swear on oath to uphold the constitution and the laws and to act in the best interests of the country. And the judges themselves swear the same oath that they will ensure the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. So the, J, the Judicial Service Commission is seen to be the, a non-partisan, independent organ that can hold the judiciary accountable because it is its commitment is to ensuring the integrity of the judiciary and not to further any political interests. Um, and, and why your question is so pertinent is precisely because when for the first 20 years of the Judicial Service Commission's existence, 
it never had a judicial conduct tribunal which ever had enough power to impeach a president a, a, a well a, a judge and especially the judge president of the western cape because there weren't ever really big or serious issues it's only when the Hlope matter first came to light that the judicial service commission had to acknowledge that it didn't actually have the capacity to hold a judge properly accountable. And that's when a judicial conduct tribunal was established. So it's also been an evolving process to hold the judiciary accountable. Because for a long time, there was this absolute belief that the judges were definitely beyond reproach. And it was only when the Clawpe case was now divulged by the judges of the Constitutional Court when they complained to the JSC that the JSC realized we, we, we don't have teeth to actually do what <laughs> we're empowered to do. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's a, an answer, a good enough answer, but that's how we now can be assured that the judiciary is going to be accountable. And, right. and for the most part, we don't have any reason to complain. I uh, think that is long enough, Prof. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Letuma Osaletsi, I see your hand is up, but Alice Raisecha Matole also has your hand up for a long time. So, I, thank you, Prof. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, three things. Some there will be comments, you just tell me how you feel about, about them. So, there is some way where it says everyone is equal before the law. Uh, I've got a problem with this uh, comment or a line or a statement mm. because I feel that our, um, do, do I say politicians? Our yes. politicians are not being held accountable for things that they, they are doing. Even if the government has got proof of the things that they've done, like we have seen with the... Um, Agrisi when he came mm. to state commission and exposing people to say people were being given a, a bags of meat and whatnot, like how the country is just being sold out with so much little, like it was just a, to me, it was a disgrace because I felt, yes, we are saying everyone is equal before the law, but it seems like our politicians are getting away with corruption. They are getting away with destroying our country and not be and while i'm on that i still don't even know why the uh, the, the the zondo commission exists maybe you can help us and share a light there and then secondly i've got a statement it says um okay out of interest sake uh when you spoke about the president who came here and then he was supposed to be the warrant of arrest that came. So my question is, why did they wait for him to come to South Africa for him to be arrested? And there also, can you please share the light with me? And then with counter-majoritarian dilemma, I want to understand that was this concept formed to challenge the ju ju judiciary and why was that? Because I feel in terms of separation of power, the way the ju judiciary is structured, it seems like uh, they were able to, even though the measures of, um, what can I say, the way the judges we are saying we are trusting them is just a matter of, it's not like they are signing a contract or what is just for us saying in terms of integrity, we trust that they will do the work. So I just wanted to, for you to share a light on the counter-majoritarian to say, are they trying to challenge the judiciary? Because it seems like it's not everyone who understands the way the judiciary is taking decisions and the powers that are being given, uh, like they are allocated on them. As the other speaker, I think it's Senzo, who said he feels the judiciary is given so much power than the, uh, than the other um, but the executive and the legislation. And also, ma'am, the, the last one, Prof, um, about the Ace Mahashule and Dalimpov versus the president, I'm sure they'll be going to court. Yes. Uh, in terms of the law there, what do you think? 
Thank you. Well, that's a lot of questions and I, I hope I remember all of them. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to start with the, your question about Omar al Bashir, the Sudanese president. You see. In terms of international law. The South African. Police. Who have the right to arrest a person can only do so when the person is actually in the territory. So for a long time, there was no one knew whether or not he, a President Omar al-Bashir would really come to South Africa. Because as we'd seen before, he knew he got advice not to come in 2019 and 2009. And so there was still a lot of um, confusion about whether he really would come or not. And so the processes um, in terms of the rule of law, that, it, that means that there shall be proper processes followed by everybody. The process is you can only start the process of getting an arrest warrant in terms of that law once you have absolute proof the person is on the territory. And so no one knew that his plane had actually landed, but it was apparently someone in the AU meeting in Santon City the, or the convention center who sent out a message saying Omar al-Bashir is here. And that's when the National Prosecuting Authority uh, and a whole lot of NGOs, it was actually the Southern African Litigation Center who started it. They're also a nonprofit organization. They're the ones who, who immediately got advocates to go to court to ask for this warrant of arrest. But the government were not being totally honest with the court. And they that during that process, it was it, the message was then sent back to Omar al-Bashir. You had better leave the country right now or else you will be arrested. And that's how he got away. And as, as you point out, um, some people are more equal than others because the president had to know who was here and who was and when he was leaving because it's the president who really he is the chief of our armed forces. He is the chief of the state. He has to be told about things like when other presidents are arriving and leaving from our territory. So there is a case where President Zuma managed to avoid any punishment, even though there was talk about, oh, number one ordered us to do this. Um, so that's the that's really the, the first one answer I have is because of just the way the law works and the slowness of processes and the fact that the president had to be complicit in allowing Omar al-Bashir to leave. Um, yeah, I, I sort of wanted to bring in the analogy of when Shepard Bushiri left and how the, there were apparently police checking the aeroplane because they weren't sure. It's similar when a president of another country leaves that there's got to be enough security to make sure that that person is actually safe. So there were a whole lot of people who knew that this was a person who should be arrested, but the president has said, let him go so that we don't have to arrest him. We don't want to be embarrassed by having to arrest him. Um, the counter-majoritarian dilemma, and, and I, the, 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 the part that I probably haven't emphasized enough, is that word dilemma where we call it a dilemma because it appears to be so undemocratic and how our judiciary has these far reaching powers and they're not constrained by the law. But it's a dilemma that doesn't exist. There is nothing wrong with it. It is it, it operates in. England as the the. the um, the discussion about the rule of law gave effect to, meaning that our courts 
have the power to make binding decisions that interpret the law and ensure that the, the law is complied with. So those members of the judiciary are given immense powers because we as the people said they must be given those powers. That was right, and that's why I gave that long discussion on, on history in our second lecture. Right from 1912, when the ANC was formed and then started developing policy documents and the Freedom Charter, they, constantly there was this reference to an independent judiciary that has the power of judicial review meaning being able to declare any law or any conduct unconstitutional in order to safeguard the, the rights and the obligations that have been imposed on everyone by this hard fought constitution. Um, then your question, I'm gonna, I can't even remember what the first one was. You'll have to remind me, but the, oh, no, no. Yes, I remember now. I remember now. Why was the Zondo Commission established? Well, that's an excellent question because it relates exactly to the cases in tutorial letter 102, which I referred you to, to one of them this evening. It was a, a situation where as president of the Republic of South Africa, the president's home must be secured. And so the president, President Zuma's personal homestead in Kandla had to be secured to the standards expected for a president. But then it became apparent that what was being created were things like a tuck shop, a amphitheater, a swimming pool that were not security related. And so many people complained to the public protector. At the time it was Tuli Madonsela. And so she undertook, because that's what her powers are in terms of chapter nine of our constitution, is to undertake a thorough investigation of these allegations of corruption and impropriety. And so she, in her report, she said, I am of the view, based on all the evidence I've been given, that the president was unduly enriched by public funds. So we as taxpayers paid for his tuck shop and his swimming pool when we shouldn't have. And so she she had recommended that the president pay back the money he owed. And that um, matter then went to the National Assembly because the National Assembly is the one that is supposed to receive the reports of the public protector and act on it. And I, I think I've said this before, how the, the National Assembly tried all sorts of tactics to avoid the president being held accountable. So they would create an ad hoc committee and the ad hoc committee would say, no, we've read through this report. We don't believe that the president was unduly enriched. So then the minister of police was told, you're in charge of security. You tell us whether you think the president was unduly enriched according to what the public protector says. And then the Minister of Police also said, no, he was definitely not unduly enriched. And so a follow up was when Tuli Maronsela said. I have received numerous complaints of state capture. Where the president is. Sort of central to this and where the, na the African National Congress are being compromised, I think is the best word, compromised by certain individuals, and there's no, not enough ac accountability. So the Nkandla case was sort of the predecessor, and that, and it was just, you know, that, that was probably the central aspect is 
that he was so unduly benefited then no one could account for all the money that was be apparently being given to to Jacob Zuma and that's when the public protector said we we need <laughs> and this is the irony too it's also section 85 of the constitution that says the president must appoint a commission of inquiry so when Tuli Madonsela wrote in a report a commission of inquiry must be established by the president. The president himself was one of the people implicated, and that was why there was a decision that the deputy president at the time should make the should formally create a commission of inquiry. And then, like I can't remember what the example was I used earlier, but it was just at that time that Jacob Zuma was recalled as the mem as the president of the Republic and then Cyril Ramaphosa took over. So it was Cyril Ramaphosa then who formally announced that we are going to have this commission of inquiry because he had been asked to do so by the public protector and because the, we have a transparent, accountable, open, responsive form of democracy, the the constitutional court said if there's a decision by the public protector that decision cannot be ignored and so cyril ramaphosa therefore didn't ignore her request for a commission of inquiry into state capture and that's why it was created so there was a history of a culmination of events leading to the need to create this independent body that will adjudicate the issues by hearing all the evidence and then making a decision based on the evidence. Um, there was one other question you had, I think. What was that? Is everyone equal before the law? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, um, Ironically, and I, I keep using the word ironic right now, but um, no, uh, most certainly not. So when I referred you earlier to, not in today's lecture, but to Ngugi Wationgo, who is the Kenyan author, he wrote a book, he's written many books, but one of them is called The Wizard of the Crow. And in it, he quite satirically talks about how certain if you're a political elite you are virtual you are untouchable you can enrich yourself to the greatest extent possible and that is just the way it is and to a large extent that is what's happening in south africa is there seems to be this idea of and i, I think someone used this expression before it's our turn to eat. We're in power, so we can enrich ourselves as much as we can now, because we don't quite know how long we'll be in power. And and I suppose there's some idea, idea of it's re not retribution, it's it's restitution. We were treated so badly during apartheid. We were deprived of a our land and our, our property. So if we are now in power, let us benefit. And those who come after us should also benefit. So no, I, I'm afraid I can't agree that everyone's equal before the law. There are most certainly cer in a, a number of individuals who are consistently able to get away with certain conduct. So that brings us then to your final question about Ace Mahashule. Um, and it's the same as Jacob Zuma, I suppose. Jacob Zuma has been insisting for years that he wants his day in court because he'll prove that he's innocent. If Ace Mahashule was absolutely convinced that he is innocent, and he respects the party political decision that said if you're accused of corruption you need to step aside which is why they pushed 
Jacob Zuma out and he had to agree. I mean, he had to finally come on national television and say, I am now resigning. Um, Ace Makhashule should also, you know, quietly move off and let, let the process unfold. But the fact that he's fighting so hard, to me, is an indication that he's he's trying to prolong the process and obviously doesn't really want to ever have to relinquish any power he's already got. Um, but if, if the constitution of the African National Congress or the, or the resolution of the ANC is that you must step aside and we are so, a dominant party democracy with a with a strict party discipline, he should have been one of the first to accept that resolution and quietly step aside. So, no, I'm, a, I'm afraid if, if he's got the money to hire Dali and Poff, who must be exhausted at the moment because he's been so busy in court, if he's got the money to, uh, to appoint Dali and Poffu to argue a really quite a, a basic point, you know, we, we do know that we were all innocent until proven guilty. And he's not yet being accused of guilt, but he's got to step aside while the processes unfold. So I'm going to go, I'm going to answer by saying, no, we are not all equal before the law and most certainly not if we refer to our discussion last week where 70 percent of the population are still living in abject poverty without a, any, you know, sufficient money for a dignified existence. We are most certainly not all equal before the law and that the, and the government Brooke. itself is not doing enough to to rectify that. Um, so Thank let, you. Let Letuma, are you there? Your hand has been up for a while. I'm here, ma'am. Okay, good. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity. And uh, yes. yeah, one yes. of actually, I had, I had two questions, but the other one was, uh, I think, was asked, and maybe you, you answered it where, where you talked about the equality. <laughs> Uh, the, the reason I was thinking about it is just that every time when we drive on the road, you will see this uh, car that carries the ministers, the executives, oh, yes. Oh, yes. driving extremely very fast. And, <laughs> you know, as because we gave an example of maybe you have to be 120 on the road, but you can see this car is really flying, you know. And now what are the things? Are they supposed to be... <laughs> always be driving like, but you know that that was the culture. So I, I wouldn't know what was the legal implications to them or were they allowed because they've got blue lights or something like that. That was that was my, my first question. And the second, my second question was that the elections are coming now. I think in the, yeah, sometime in October, uh, I see, the posters on the street sometimes where people are, are contesting in uh, elections individually so and now we said this this process is not yet complete so my question is now if now it's not yet complete why are this am i seeing these things of, of uh, people individually contesting the elections yeah, those are my, uh, questions thank you very much Yes, and I, I must admit, I, I do realize the contradiction when I said, oh, the process isn't complete, but you're already seeing signs up. Look, I think that the, the process is largely complete in that the, these are the members of the political parties who already um, have won the ward and are the councillors for the particular ward and they are re-standing for their ward or that, 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 because it's called a, a, a sort of a ward. So it, or perhaps the, 
the person who was the counselor for that ward before has left the country or has died or something. So they've got a, a replacement. Um, these those persons were already counselors for the most part, and so they're hoping to just continue to to govern that particular area. So that sort of ward. And that's why they are that their posters are up because we already know who they are for it to a large extent. They've been our counselors for the last five years. But they, there needs to be a process of formally bringing all the names to the independent electoral commission so that they can be vetted. And I don't know when that process happened, especially because of COVID last year. So I don't know whether it happens simultaneously. And, um, and, and in fact, let me tell you this, Mr. I don't know if he's here. Mr. Paul Mudal, who is my colleague, he was here earlier. He is the one who will know that answer best because he has a, a master's degree. He has a number of master's degrees, but one in local government law. So he would know all those intricacies much better than I do. Um, so and he is going to be lecturing on that, but I, I, I think it's a, it's a sort of there are things happening at the same time, like our registration weekend of the 17th and 18th, I think or 18th and 19th of July. That's part one part of the process and it's got to happen alongside all of the other processes that ensure the ultimate election can take place and that it's generally credible and free and fair. So I don't have a, an ex, you know, an absolute clear answer for why it is that we are already seeing the posters up, but I think it's probably because it's those parties that already have won the constituency and are hoping to continue. And for example, you see only some posters. I haven't seen posters for all the political parties yet. So that's also taking a while to seem to be getting going. Um, your first question, though, I can't remember that one was. No, it was relating to the, it was similar to the previous questions, whereby I was asking the issue of the, you know, the executives, the oh, ministers. Yes, and Sorry, with yes. The lights, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, no, well, that is a, an issue that I know that the Democratic Alliance in the Western Cape have been using as a sort of a campaign tool by saying we are going to eradicate blue the blue light uh, use in the Cape Metropolitan Council. So it's it's actually not acceptable. I think that there is widespread acknowledgement that it's not acceptable. Just because you're a minister and you're slightly late for a meeting, you should have made sure that you weren't going to be late for the meeting. And there should be a strict adherence to all the rules, irrespective of who you are. And therefore, you shouldn't have to rely on these convoys of blue light, blue lighted vehicles who push you off the road. And I know that there have been car accidents as a result, but in other African countries, what actually happens, and I'm just having to bring this in as a, an analogy, in other African countries, what happens is when the, the president's convoy is moving, whether you are walking or in a car, you've got to suddenly jump and move off the street. And many times people have been shot dead by the, the presidential guard because they didn't move fast enough. So, I mean, it's a it's a it's a very African issue of I'm the president. You need to recognize that I'm the president. You know, everyone must give way for me or I'm a minister. I'm someone important where that that hasn't it isn't really prevalent as much in sort of Scandinavian countries. Um, was it Boris Johnson in England who rides a bicycle something to to work sometimes, you know, they, there's a just a different culture, but I think that culture is also because of the deprivation from apartheid, and now there's a time to 
restore the dignity of those in power because we've always respected the chiefs and the kings. And likewise, if you've been a duly elected president or a minister, people must recognize you and appreciate your importance. But no, you you're, you are quite right. We aren't all equal before the law, but that is something that is still in the process of being challenged. Um, I, th I suppose it will end up in the court at some stage if someone's prepared to take it to court. Um, Nkosi Nati, do you still have a question? Yes, yes, Prof. Good, uh, good evening, and thank you very much for your yes. time. Good My evening. question is is, is, um, is, 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 is is on the same issue of this equality before the law. If if our observation and 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 position we take, you say yes, we base on what we see. We can agree that uh, we uh, we are not all equal before the law. Are we not running a risk of uncertainty and uh, unpredictability uh, as a country or as a nation? If we if we take that or agree that today there is an issue of a, 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 a not all of us or the uh, issue of an accountability of some of um, the, the political uh, high profile political figures. Now maybe that's just to give you a scenario, a kind of scenario which is happening in our country, Prof. Just your comment, uh, the of the former heads of state where he's failing to comply with the directives of the uh, Zondo Commission as well as even if the court directed him to do so, but he's still failing to comply with it. Are we not running a risk of a unpredictability, mm. uncertainty, and uh, what will be the impact of that when it comes to the issue of uh, investors' confidence? I would like to know, I um, mean, to get your, uh, your, your, your comment on that. Thank you, uh, Prof. Well, yes, you know, I mean, I think that, that we, we've seen the evidence of um, a situation where there's unpredictability and uncertainty and how it has a direct correlation with our economy if we use the situation where Des van Rooyen was made Minister of Finance all of a sudden, and it came from nowhere, and how our our economy, virt in fact, I'm not even virtually, was downgraded to junk status as a result of that uncertainty and unpredictability that that transpired just with that single incident. Um, but I well, I so I've used the Somalia example, but equally so in in countries that are so big, like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the government can't have control everywhere. There's most certainly going to be uncertainty and unpredictability and conflict. And, and that's what's possibly going to happen in this country, is we were already such a, a, a damaged society. And, and I, I use here, yeah, from, it's from, you've seen it in tutorial letter, in fact, on the welcome page of my UNISA, I have it there, and I think also in tutorial letter 101, where a prominent African theorist says that we're all, white and black, damaged by apartheid and colonization. And so we are all such a, a highly strung, damaged population that the slightest provocation can lead to people taking the law into their own hands. And there is then unpredictability and uncertainty, which causes further confusion. And I, I think that the issues of, for example, land invasions, when there's this open piece of land and the people think, well, no one else is using the land. I don't have anywhere to live. I'm going to take the land and, you know, build a, a shack on it. Even though they are homeless, 
in order to ensure predictability and certainty, they unfortunately do have to be evicted in as a degrading a manner as it is done because our, the government is supposed to be trying its best to uphold the rule of law and to ensure the predictability and certainty. And so uh, 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 I suppose it reinforces the point you've made. The poor are consistently the ones who are being evicted and re, uh, re dehumanized by the government. Yet when someone in power can go to Saxonwald and leave with a bag full of money, no one says a word. You know, so I, I, I mean, it's it's a very complex um, issue because we're, you know, we're a, a, a young democracy navigating our way, and that's why we have this decolonized form of separation of power. So we're all still trying to find our way, but unfortunately, those in power are protected, and I, I, I suppose I need to reinforce this point too. Again, in tutorial letter 102, I have the corruption watch in Kasana case for the specific reason of showing you how the National Prosecuting Authority over a number of years was deliberately and systematically undermined so that the people in power and who were decision makers with those who were pliable and amenable and were able to be manipulated by political figures. So that is how the, the inequality was perpetrated even more and people in power were protected precisely because the National Prosecuting Authority was denuded of all its real power. And that's where we now are restoring the National Prosecuting Authority. And I think we're trying to restore the integrity of the police as well, because they've been accused of collusion with, you know, uh, cash and transit heists or with other forms of or gangsterism and, uh, you know, providing the guns for gangsterism, which is destabilizing society. So it, it's a very complex issue. It, it does involve s sociology and politics and an understanding of history and an understanding of just who we are as individuals and how we understand our role in society when we've when we're damaged. We're all damaged. We can't deny that we are a damaged group of people who are now trying to be cohesive with whatever we can <laughs> yeah I, I, it's a very difficult question to answer but i i have to insist that we are certainly not equal before the law and hopefully the state capture commission will culminate in some measures being taken and accountability being restored in our society so I'm of hope that that satisfies you because it's a it's a very difficult question to answer. No, mouthful, uh, Prof. Thank yeah, you. yeah. We'll it'll spend we'll spend days trying to find an answer. So Victor or Cabello? I don't know who was first. I think Victor um, hasn't spoken yet. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, you know, I I have a concern, and um, it's basically based on um, Section 25 of yes. where it says no one may be deprived of property in terms of law of general application. But now, if I look at the situation around here, bro, and I've seen also several court cases whereby people just got into the building and occupied mm -hmm. the building. And then the owner of the building could not even evict those people. So whose rights has been taken into consideration under those two circumstances? But before you give me answer to that yes. one, I just want to highlight the one that my colleague just asked about the elections. 
I yes. think now there's been by-elections in most of the cases, most of the areas. So I'm working for a political party. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of by-elections in, in across the country. So I think that is where you will see most of the posters being placed. So, yeah, that is a... And then the Electoral Act, as far as I can remember, it came into effect on the 1st of April. Oh, so that's so, yeah, the first of, of this April, this is when the Electoral Act was came into effect. Yeah, so you can answer the one on the uh, Section 25. Thanks, ma'am. Well, uh, no, thank you for the, the contribution about the, the by-elections, but I don't know where anyone else is from, but I, I have seen posters in Pretoria for the Freedom Front Plus and the EFF, but that's all. And there weren't by-elections in Pretoria. So that's where I, I have to agree that some things are happening quite fast. And I don't know if everything's been put in place yet, um, but I would like to think that everything has been is being done according to the processes in terms of the electoral system that we currently have. Um, then your question on, oh yes, section 25. Well, that has been one of the main criticisms of the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act, the, the PI Act. Yeah. Um, so that has certainly been the, the situation that in order for you to evict anyone, you've got to You've got to, either you as an individual or in the case of a, a municipality, you've actually got the onus of finding suitable alternative accommodation for this group of people, especially when there are children and elderly or disabled people. Now, that is, that does seem to be a wholly inequitable or asymmetrical obligation on a legitimate owner of property who is being deprived of their rights. But again, what was supposed to happen is you make the PI application and so we call it a PI application and the court usually does give or mandate the municipality if, the, if this is a homeless group of people or people who would be homeless otherwise, he, they usually do mandate the municipality to meaningfully engage with the group of people and find somewhere for them to go. And therefore a time frame is given in order to afford that to happen so that the owner can restore his ownership undisturbed. But what I've heard about, I've never seen this myself, um, I, when I used to lecture at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, I was also an attorney for a while there, so this is where I heard it, that what a lot of people would end up doing is they'd already lost the full use of their property. So they would send someone, an arsonist, to burn the property, regardless of whether the people are in there or not, um, so that they have... They can put in an insurance claim to you know, allow them to actually rec recoup their losses, even though it is the very opposite of the rule of law because they haven't followed proper processes. It's probably attempted murder, if not murder, if people do die. But that that is the point uh, that you're making, uh, that you are asking this question for is, it's so difficult in a situation like that that people become desperate and do resort to desperate measures because they, they know it's going to cost them thousands of rands in legal fees and they have a, no time frame, no real time frame because if the community keeps saying, we've got nowhere to go, we've got minor children, who go to school across the road. We've got the elderly here who go to the post office just around the corner to get their pensions. The, the government hasn't got low, you know, 
copious quantities of open land or the ability to build houses for those people. So it is going to be a long protracted process. And unfortunately, that the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act has exacerbated tension in communities. But that was seen to be a rational law at the time. And it's still in place, so obviously the legislature is happy with how it works. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I suppose it suits it suits the yeah, well, thanks, Department of thanks Human, very human much, Settlements. Thanks very much for, yes, for yeah. the answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, again, I, it, there isn't a real answer that would yeah, be suitable. Although, although it, it is concerning. Yeah, it yeah. is concerning. Uh, there seems yeah. to people seem to be taking uh, advantage of our legal system and processes. But anyway, that's how it is. And yeah, well, thanks a lot for the answer, Prof. All right, no thanks. Cabello? Uh, yes. yes, yes, I'm still here, thanks. Uh, I just want to go back to the al Bashir matter. Yes. Um, isn't it then because the president was by law required to uphold even though they've decided to pull out from the international law that was set out at the time mm. shouldn't then he and the minister of international affairs at the time now be held liable criminally because now they have failed in this regard i understand that it could be a gray area but fact of the matter is as a sitting president, you should know if a state member is in your country, because mm. that is the first thing, especially on the securities part. Yeah. So now, because having allowed al Bishi, most notably for his play to be shifted from uh, mm. a public airport to almost like a private one, so should he then not be liable criminally for the matter? Look, I must say, um, so the in the EF the 2016 EFF case, so literally a year later, was when the Constitutional Court made the assertion that in terms of Section 83 of the Constitution, the president must at all times uphold, respect, and obey the Constitution. But what was the pro pro problematic? At the time of the Al Bashir matter, and this is where it's a it actually it's a, a deeply more of an international law issue. What where or the excuse? Let me say that the president and the minister of international relations could use, and they did actually succeed in using this argument. Is their argument was that the territory where the summit was happening so santon yeah. um was was seen as being part of ethiopia and i say ethiopia because that's where the headquarters of the african union are and that therefore the south african government in terms of the principle of immunity um, that a person, a person who is on the soil of a party, a, a state that has said that it's not going to comply with that law um, dealing with crimes against humanity, because Ethiopia hasn't, because of the, the argument used was that this piece of land in Santon should, for all intents and purposes, have been regarded as Ethiopia. That therefore, that was an that was a, a, a convenient excuse, and there have been many articles written precisely on this. That that in international law, you do have a United Nations Convention on Privileges and Immunities that is given to to heads of state, and on the other hand, we had this inter, this this domestic law. And the two were clashing. So how the, the fact that they could get the, the, the fact that they were not prosecuted, they being the president and the minister, is because they were, could rely on this immunity principle. And also, as I've, I've just pointed out, 
that was the time when our national prosecuting authority was completely powerless. So they would never have dared to try to hold the president accountable. And that's why there were all sorts of sort of investigations and certain people were seen as the scapegoats who got fired. And one of those scapegoats who got fired is I think now an ambassador in Japan or something to that effect. So you see how, uh, and that's why I, I keep coming back to the concept of a dominant party democracy, where the ANC is so powerful that they could systematically undermine the National Prosecuting Authority, and therefore the National Prosecuting Authority would never have dreamed of trying to prosecute the president or the minister. They rather just act as though they have absolutely no idea of what's going on and that they assume that they say there's not enough evidence to convict because there is this immunities treaty and leave it at that. So that's why I am concerned that our dominant party democracy has undermined these institutions that are supposed to be independent and impartial. And, and that the where I get all of this from is the article by Sujit Chowdhury, which actually was dealing with the Hlope case, because Hlope, John Hlope, was trying to influence the Constitutional Court for political reasons, because of Jacob Zuma, who he is, he sees as an ally, and they are, I'm assuming, of the same political party, and therefore the even the the judiciary was compromised by its dominance by ANC members, and that's what we need to overcome. Um, in time, is where. There isn't one party that has so much power that it erodes the rule of law and compliance with the Constitution in so many other respects. So that's that's really the answer. There's, there's there always are <laughs> two are you know different ways to interpret a situation. Yeah. And if the immunity argument worked, then that is the way it was going to be. And then uh, just lastly, my, my last one is uh, with regards to that very international law. Um, I'm not sure, is it the National Assembly or the executive that's in charge of it? Well, that's the thing. The, the, the executive, in terms of Section 231 of the Constitution, is the one that initially, because now it's head of state, president. Um, and, and that's where the confusion is. You'll see in Chapter 5, that they, it's often very difficult to make the distinction between when the president is acting as head of state and head of executive. The general consensus is if the president is making a political decision, he's acting as head of the executive. Yeah. If he's just acting in terms of the powers bestowed on him by the constitution, then it seemed to be, and there's no discretion, you know, he's got to do what, the constitution says he must do then he's acting as head of state so in terms of section 231 of the constitution that it simply says the executive is the one that negotiates these international treaties because the president is the one who's going to go to new york to the un and sit around that table and discuss this new law so so the executive and that's where he's actually head, acting as head of state. But head of state, yeah. It becomes an executive decision because it's it's what is the political view of South Africa? Would we want to be part of this treaty or not? And so the, that's where you can't really tell the distinction. But the executive is the one that signs and negotiates these treaties. But the minute the president has signed, it's it's called depositing your instrument of ratification. Once they've done that and said to the UN or the African Union, we want to be part of this treaty. Because we are a monist state, 
we um our, our lord of the right we actually also but slightly monist and dualist so let me rather take the dualist approach those international laws do automatically become laws of the state unless they are unconstitutional yeah but in order for the for for the mo for most of the laws to to be able to be implemented at the domestic level the legislature is the one that's got to draft a domestic implementing law and so in the case of the of the the withdrawal from the rome statute it should have been parliament that drafted a withdrawal of the Ro from the rome statute legislation but instead the executive, meaning the minister of, of international relations, simply said to the UN, we are withdrawing. You know, there wasn't the proper process of first the legislature drafting a law, then the executive discussing whether this is actually acceptable law. And because remember, once the bill has been accepted by the legislature, only then is it sent back back to the president to be assented to which is when the executive plays the role of saying yes i agree with this law and if the president doesn't agree with the law he isn't obliged to sign it he can send it back to parliament and say i'm not satisfied with this provision i yeah. have reservations about its constitutionality and they then need to fix it then the law comes back to him if he's still not satisfied, he can refer the that bill to the constitutional okay. court. So it shows you that, in fact, the the legislature should have played the dominant role and drafted the law and only then given it to the president as head of the executive to decide to decide upon whether or not this is in terms of the party political you know, ethos or vision. Yeah. And then when he signs it, though, this is the, the the distinction. Once he signs it, he's actually doing so as head of state. Because then he's no longer got any dis any discretion. Because after the Constitutional Court has told him there's nothing wrong with this law, he can't exercise any further discretion. He has to sign the law. And that assenting to the law is him doing so in his capacity as head of state and then it immediately becomes law or becomes law on a date as determined in that legislation now so that just shows you the close relationship between how the legislature and the executive function and that there is sometimes a there is a blurring of the distinction because even when law is drafted you'd think it would start in parliament but it doesn't it's usually a member of cabinet who's responsible for housing or health yeah who will say i think we need to draft a new law on this aspect and then there'll be a political discussion about whether there should be this law and only then is it converted into a white paper to be discussed and then where public participation can occur in the in parliament so even the whole legislative process doesn't start in the in the legislature as it should but in the case of the withdrawal statute it it was simply a case of the legislature should have been the one that started the process and said we are drafting a law to withdraw and then give it to the president for him to decide whether he agrees or not but it happened the opposite way around where the president and the minister just said, you know, it's a bit like when the rules are inconvenient, you just change the rules. That was really the situation. It was inconvenient at the time for them to have to explain to the ICC why they didn't arrest Omar al-Bashir. They were put under, they were ostracized. Botswana, for example, criticized South Africa and said, how can you say you're a, constitutional democracy when you violate the rule of law 
so it was an embarrassing scenario and that's when the executive then you know like a a spoiled child just said well then we don't want to be part of this but they didn't have the right to do it it was actually parliament representing us as the people who should have started that process of drafting a withdrawal treaty and a withdrawal law from the treaty so that with that regard because it is it seems to be very clear that they did violate the constitution as it says that anything deemed to be unconstitutional regarding mm. that should be invalid shouldn't then be as a matter of punishment they be sentenced as a regard because that's no you know members of parliament and cabinet members have a lot of what we call privileges associated and if they are acting and i want to say bona fide but as i don't think that's a good ex good example right now but if they are acting in the course and scope of their mandate as the minister of of international relations or as the president of the state yeah they are immune from prosecution they can't be easily found guilty i mean they, they for, for them to even be um charged in the first instance is not likely to happen because they have certain immunities and they can say i was doing this legitimately in the course and scope of my employment as a minister and that is the protection they have so they they are privileges associated um with members of of the legislature and then with the executive and that actually is also why delil in the delil case when she was told you're now suspended from parliament because you're saying things that are unparliamentary yeah she actually has a privilege to say anything in parliament that can and it cannot be held against her if she is engaging in legitimate debate about parliamentary issues so that's why there's not this criminal that they are they are protected against civil liability um and and to be fair who would try and prosecute the president um you know you have to get the buy-in of the national prosecuting authority and the police which would be very difficult to do so it's it's just not feasible even though they should be punished there isn't enough accountability in our constitutional state and that's why we have the public protector who is supposed to ensure accountability and we're now finally seeing some of that with the state uh, capture inquiry but it's it's all an evolving processes of process of us developing our own form of democracy that best suits our needs our interests and that works for the majority All yeah right. yeah no, i understand what you mean thank you prof <laughs> letuma you no, have a question no, thanks prof yes it was just a follow-up from the what we just explained right now Yes. Uh, when you see the members of the pyramid, they've got the, 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 they are protected. Now, my question is that if maybe they, have, they, they are found to have misused that privilege, uh, does it mean that they can do anything they like whatsoever and they won't be held accountable? No, and I think that's what's so important about this current Butterbele Lamini precedent that's been set where she she accounted to parliament but wasn't open and honest and then as a result of that was um required the constitutional court asked her to come and account to them and they then held her accountable but i think she's she's realized that as a member of the ANC, the ANC is now becoming stricter in terms of the rules. And she probably realized if she didn't pay the money as when she did, she too would be suspended from the ANC. And then that would risk her position as a 
as the head of the ANC women's um, women's what's it called? League, wo women's league. Sorry, <laughs> I wanted to say forum. Um, so no, it doesn't mean that parliamentarians can do as they please. There is a certain measure of accountability. Uh, and the public protector is playing the most dominant role there at the moment. But we should, as I said, we are supposed to, in terms of our constitution, have a system where the, all of the members of the executive account to parliament re re uh, regularly about exactly what they're doing and what they're not doing. And for example, in the case of housing, where not enough houses are being built, yet we are so many years into democracy and so much money has been spent. The Minister of Human Settlements should be taken to task, but because we have this dominant party democracy, the Speaker, who's a member of the ANC, is going to be a little bit softer on ANC members. And that's where a large part of our problem lies, is that we the, the, there's so little distinction between party, as in the ANC, and state that we often, in fact, the the textbook goes on about this at quite a, quite a lot. That the, the, there is this fusion of party and state, where members of the ANC believe that they are untouchable because they're members of the ANC, and this is their state. They are in control of everything, and no one would question them. Uh, that and that's been the the situation, I would say, until the com the state capture commission, when now finally we are getting some information, and we think that there's going to be consequence management, but we aren't sure. Uh, I mean, who knows? Uh, Judge Zondo himself has had to admit that he's not going to have time to make findings on all of the issues. So which issues are, are going to be left out? We don't know. And it's not because he might be compromised in terms of his party political affiliation. It's simply because the evidence is not enough for him to make particular findings. And, and that's just the nature of this process where it is so time consuming, so costly to the state, to hold the Commission of Inquiry. It's doing the best it can, but it might not end up with as much accountability as we're all hoping for. But we have to remain optimistic, I would say. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's the answer is just that we in, intended when the Constitution was drafted to have a, a, accountable, open, responsive democracy. But accountability has fallen short and has been for a long time. There have been cases where the courts just, their decisions are not being implemented and ministers are getting away with not performing without any consequences. So that is my response. Might not be to your liking, but that is my response. Um, yes, so I, I have to just, I think, let's end on this note. I said right from the outset that constitutional law is the most political area of law. You cannot separate politics and constitutional law, and that's what makes it so much more complex to navigate. All right, so are we all happy for now? For this evening? All right, so shall we all? Yes, we are. Go to bed. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. So as I say, next week is Professor Shai, and on your schedule the following week, I don't have a lecture scheduled because I'm going to be away where I'm not going to have internet at all, but Prof Shai or Prof Mudal, uh, Mr. Mudal might do a lecture. I haven't discussed it with them yet, 
Um, so at this stage, you also have a, a holiday then, um, which is where you can start preparing assignment two. How about that? <laughs> yeah. All right. So good night, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Yes. Should have fool. <laughs> oh, you're still there, colleagues? Anyone still there? Ish. I forgot to answer, ask one question. What do you want to ask, Lebo? Um, separation of powers. No man, the certification process. Is it is it really binding or is not binding on the president? No man, it's not the separation. The judicial the decision of the JSE, Judicial Service Commission, is it binding or is not binding on the president? 